Good evening. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for the program this evening. My name is Angela Davis, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The SAB is a bipartisan group. As a member of the SAB, I get access to many great opportunities by being involved with the Institute. If you are a KU student and are interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this evening's event, if you would like to know more about our guests, the event itself, upcoming Institute events, and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the YouTube event description below. At the end of this evening's event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guests. Please type your question in the YouTube chat box on your screen. Please hold all questions until the end of the program. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, disrespectful, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. This evening's program is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. And now please join me in welcoming Senior Associate Director of the Institute, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you very much and welcome uh, to part two of a conversation on race. I am delighted this evening to have our, our guests with us. And for, I said part two, so I'll go with part one. We remember if you were looking at it was June 16th and it was a program that was suggested by our student advisory board and uh, we approved it and it had been very popular. Um, and I will mention a little bit uh, similar to the introduction, but one of them that minds really can change. You know, things happen over time and people begin to change their attitudes about things. But basically, President George Bush used the term systemic racism, which comports with the views of, of more than 80% of Americans. And we also know that these are very trying times. Uh, we have a lot of racial tensions going on. Uh, we also know that uh, independents are playing a very uh, crucial role in uh, what's going on at, in, in our history, I would say, at this time. But what's more important, it's been reported that this pandemic being unprecedented has created additional problems for people, not just health. And we know that the country today is very divided. They're very exhausted. And many are very angry. And what we're used to with our country is, you know, we want to go back to dignity and respect, perhaps being less polarized more caring about each other. And that's what our conversation is all about. And, you know, if you don't try to make a difference, you can't if you don't talk about it. You have to recognize there's a problem. And then you have to look at that problem and say, what can we do about it? But more importantly, what can we do about it together? Again, a conversation on race. I would like to introduce our guests this evening. And again, a conversation on race is not going to be the cure-all, but what it will be is a stepping block for us to make progress. This program this evening is co-sponsored by the KU Office of Multicultural Affairs. And we have four outstanding guests with us this evening. Christina Haswood is a public health professional and a candidate for the Kansas House of Representatives, our 10th district. She will run unopposed in the general election. Camelo J. Rios Santiago, is the current majority leader of the Puerto Rico State Senate. 
He was elected in 2018 as president of the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators, a nonprofit organization representing over 400 elected Hispanic state legislators throughout the United States, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Sharon Tomiko Santos was elected to the Washington State House of Representatives in 1998. She chairs the House Education Committee and serves on the House Capital Budget Committee and Consumer Protection and Business Committee. She is also a former chair of the National Asian uh, Pacific uh, State Legislators. And you will find out that the three of us were members of the Quad Caucus and we'll explain more about the Quad Caucus. Jean Vickery was elected to the Kansas House in 1992 and recently retired after 28 years. I am delighted to say he and I both came into the Kansas House together. We have become really good friends and I have lots of respect for Jean Victory. He was elected to serve as Assistant Majority Leader, Speaker Pro Tem, and Majority Leader for two terms. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our guests to you and I would say welcome please our distinguished guests. Thank you. Thank you. We will start right from the beginning. Why is race so difficult for individuals to talk about? And uh, let's start with Representative Tomiko Santos. Well, thank you, Representative Ballard, um, for that very thoughtful and provocative question. Um, I think uh, that race is difficult because to, to talk about, in part because it has been part of the American um, experience since before we were a country. Uh, many of you who are historians will recall that um, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, pre predicted uh, that the problem of America would be the color line. And so um, it is part of our consciousness. And I think the challenge has been uh, not being able to put ourselves in one another's shoes, not being able to engage in a conversation where um, one side doesn't feel um, uh, defensive uh, and the other side doesn't feel marginalized. Um, I know that that has been my experience, both as an individual, but also as a representative of my uh, legislative district, which in the state of Washington is actually the most diverse legislative um, district in our state. Okay. Uh, Representative Rio, Santiago. Well, uh, for me as a Latino, and I've been actually uh, on both sides of the, of the aisle, meaning I'm living in Puerto Rico where we are a mixed race and we have blacks, Spaniards, Latinos, whites all together. And it's not a big issue, uh, but my personal story, as you know, Barbara, uh, I went to a high school, it's a military prep school in Melbourne, uh, Florida Air Academy. And then I got a scholarship to play for a historically black college. And, and uh, I was the first Puerto Rican to play there. So for me, being a, uh, the race wasn't a big issue until I realized that they're still separate but equal. So it's kind of the big elephant in the room. No one wants to talk about it. It's there. We leave it every day. Uh, but we try to ignore it every day until now uh, that we have a president that calls it and uh, people are getting rowdy about it. Uh, and then from Puerto Rico, I say, why? It's been there all the time. Uh, it's just a, not a main issue in mainstream America, even though we talk about it every day. Uh, so for me, race, uh, being a Latino, living in the States for a while was an issue. Then I became a member of the Quad Caucus. And I understood that it wasn't a Latino issue only or a black issue. It was Haitians, it was uh, immigrants, even if you were white, uh, how neighborhoods plan out, Italians, uh, Easterns, uh, Chinese. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a thing that I can go on and on and on because I've been on both sides of the aisle, like I said. Good, you know what, and I just realized 
I think I called you representative. So I'm my friend, my, my, I apologize. This is my senator <laughs> here. And I was just going on because after this, I'm gonna refer to you by first names, but I'm gonna give you respect from the beginning. Okay. All right. All so right. I'm going to go with representative uh, Victory. And uh, would you answer that question as well, please? I believe a, a lot of it's just fear unknown. I grew up in rural Kansas and uh, a small community on a farm. And uh, a lot of my classmates, a lot of my friends, I don't think that they knew a lot of people that were different. We were predominantly a, a white um, middle class community and we didn't know people that weren't like us. So I, I think it was really a lot of fear and unknown. Okay. Uh, Ms. Christina, would you comment on that as well? I believe as an indigenous woman, race is hard to talk about. It's uncomfortable. Change is hard and to own up to what we were taught in our childhood, um, what comes to mind, Halloween's coming up, Native American costumes, um, having Pocahontas, you know, from a Disney movie to us finding the real history that she was only 12 years old when John Smith came over, um, kind of exposing the truth of our history that's been sugarcoated. Um, we can see systemic racism lingering in a lot of aspects of our society, from housing to our gap of disparity of education to COVID-19. I'm from the Navajo reservation, that's my tribe, and we were at impact the hardest. And we can see that there's not much coverage of the reservations and looking at the other four reservations in Kansas, they're not really getting highlighted or talked about of, of their disparities. Um, and I think that we didn't grow up being proud of who we were as people of color. We were, you know, growing up and I reflect on my childhood, I just wanted to be like everybody else. I was always ashamed of wearing my jewelry. I was always ashamed of wanting to wear my traditional clothing. But now I see that there's a change with our younger generation being proud of who they are and celebrating this culture, um, even through social media. So race is hard to talk about. Um, I think we're gonna have to do these tough conversations and help people um, who are not a part of the of people of color to help guide them through these conversations. Right. So now this will be an opportunity. Uh, I'm doing it a little differently than I did the first time, but what do you want us to know about your race? And this is your opportunity to tell us what you want us to know. And uh, I mentioned the Quad Caucus. The Quad Caucus was actually Asian, Black, Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanic. And we met um, for three years. Uh, we had a million dollar grant from the National Conference of uh, State Legislatures uh, from the Kellogg Foundation. And each of our caucuses, regardless of the size, we each had 12 members apiece. So we're on equal footing. And we met and we took turns with each one of the caucuses having the meetings for us for two days. And we had to talk about, or we talked about our race and what we didn't even know about each other. And we got to know about each other. And now it's like we're almost inseparable in so many ways because when we need something, we can call the other, we can count on them to do it because we had to learn. Well, if we had to learn and we were all four of color, we know that the other people without having those same opportunities would be a little more difficult. And again, this is what a conversation on race is all about. So what I'm asking now, to tell us what you want us to know about your race. And you can have about three minutes of peace on this. And I think I will start uh, with uh, Camelo. Well, Barbara, thank you for the opportunity. First of all, I would like to start saying that all Latinos are not created equal. Uh, we might look like it, but we have different backgrounds. We have different cultures and uh, we complement each other. And uh, within the Latino community, uh, when you talk about Mexican Americans, there are Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, you see a culture that is so diverse uh, that it's kind of a word by itself. It's like a United Nations without itself. 
So when I see people talk about Latinos and profiling and uh, because the Dominicans are moving or Puerto Ricans, let it be known that uh, we might look alike, but we have different issues. And that's something that not that many people know. We are sympathetic with all the issues that, for, for example, immigration. That's something that uh, I don't have that issue in Puerto Rico because we don't have borders like in Mexico or Texas. We do have borders with the Dominican Republic, but because we look so much and we are so much alike culturally and physically, it's not like a, it's a chop, like, unlike Texas, like California and all some other places. And they, 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 what I want to say is when you look at a Latino, you're looking at a person that probably comes from a different cultural background, have different issues, but are willing to adapt. Latinos, uh, we adapt very quickly. And uh, we have actually uh, many, many uh, contributions that are go on granted. I mean, we don't only speak Spanish and have English as a second language, but we are willing to work. We are hard workers. Uh, we are willing to be part of these great nations. And sometimes we're not given the chance just because where we're from. And as a US citizen myself, by birthright, I might not have the issues that people from Central America have, but I know they're there. And sometimes as Latinos, let it be known, we look the other way because we say it's not our problem. It's somebody else's problem. And uh, what I learned uh, throughout my experience uh, in during the States and the Quad Caucus is we better start working together because even though we don't look alike, we have similar issues and we need to take care of each other, not because we are people of color, just because we are people. All right. Jean, tell us about your race, you know, because when we start talking about people of color, everybody has issues within their own race. And so tell us what you want us to know. That's a very uh, deep thought provoking question. I'm trying to get my thoughts around it. I, I guess first I'd say that most of us, I, I would believe, would want to say that I don't, I don't believe that we are hateful or, you know, uh, the bigotry is something that, that most of my friends, myself, find just abhorrent, I have a disdain for. And I think that that's what most all of my friends, and maybe I'm in a unique group, but you know, I find when, you know, you see those clips on uh, the evening news where there's somebody that's just being over the top out there, a racist, yeah. uh, a Klan member, whatever, flying a, a, a flag that's rude and being obnoxious, that that's not who most of us are. There's uh, some that are, you know, and I don't, I don't know how to fix that. I wish there is a way to, to uh, straighten people out, you know, and uh, I think we all understand we have to take care of ourselves and our family, teach our family right, teach who we can and our group of friends to, to live right and we can improve our world that way. But, you know, it, it is something that uh, hopefully I'm right. You know, I, and maybe it's unique being from uh, Kansas. You know, Kansas is such a hospitable, friendly place. We uh, tend to like each other. And hopefully that's something that spreads further than just the Midwest. Okay. Christina. I first want to start off saying that we're still here. Even though we're a small population, if you look at us in the census, sometimes when you're looking at statistics of us, we're at the bottom of a table with a little star saying this population was too small to calculate. We're still here. We're resilient people. Um, one of the things I think people don't get the education on or seek the education is tribal sovereignty. So me being Navajo Diné from the Navajo Nation, I am one of 574 federally recognized tribes. I am just only one person. So oftentimes when I speak, I don't speak for everybody. I'm originally from the Southwest. And another statistic, 
70% of us live off the reservation. And this is one of the reasons why I got into politics is because a lot of policy is made toward the reservation and tribal sovereignty, but majority of us live off the reservation. So we're not, there's a gap in us, us receiving our, our treaty rights. There's also a dark history with the United States government with genocide and with voter suppression. We were just United States citizens in 1924, us being indigenous peoples, the first peoples here, we have faced a lot of turmoil, but we are resilient people. We're still here today. And we are always educating people and inviting people to always in include us in the conversation, include us at being at the table. Um, and I also want to invite the audience to not be afraid to research our culture and our history and to look at the people around you. Uh, remind yourself which lands that you're on. You can Google who was previously occupiers of this land, of this indigenous land that I was on. And, you know, come to our powwows. Um, get engaged with our community because we are more than welcome to educate you. And we are the prayers of our ancestors. Our ancestors survived genocide. For me, Navajo, the long walk. So, you know, there's so many things that happen within our history that, you know, even voting, there was so much voter suppression that that is such a powerful thing that we need to take back. Sharon? Thank you, Barbara. I was so caught up in uh, Christina's uh, comments and very moved. So thank you very much for, for sharing all of that. Um, I think uh, that Jean actually uh, touched on a piece that is very, very important. Um, and I think uh, actually all, all of us have touched on this. And that is um, if we don't know uh, about one another, it's easier to be afraid um, and it's either easier to stay apart. But I think the lesson certainly of the Quad Caucus is we were put in uh, a room together and um, we had to talk to one another and we were able to learn about one another's histories and learn about um, where there are similarities, where there may have been some differences. I think for me, uh, speaking as an Asian American Pacific Islander uh, woman, um, there are two elements. One is uh, I have an identity as uh, an Asian American woman. Um, and there are many, many myths about uh, Asians. Um, you all have probably heard of, and if you haven't heard of, you've probably at least understood the concept of the model minority. Whenever um, you look at the statistical data or whenever the experts are referring to the specific uh, statistical data, they always rank Asians uh, and Asian Americans very high up, sometimes higher than white Americans, whether it's educational attainment, whether it's uh, income. Um, but like uh, the Latino community, like uh, the Native community, Asian Americans are a very diverse population. And one of the issues, and I know Barbara uh, spoke about this in her introductory comments, um, uh, so I won't delve into too much detail, but one of the elements that we really care about deeply is data disaggregation, because when we start looking more closely at the different experiences of, say, for example, like myself, a second, third uh, generation Japanese American uh, who, who has uh, two parents who are college educated, one who was born in the United States, another who was an immigrant versus, for example, um, some of our Southeast Asian uh, populations, where as recently as the last census, not the current census, um, it, I, you might be surprised to learn that almost 35% of Laotian Americans do not even have a high school diploma. That relation, that number goes up to 40% when you talk about Hmong Americans. And so when you talk about funding that follows the data, we have to be very careful about what kind of data we're using to prop up different policies. And the model minority one is as both an uh, Asian American and as a woman, I am having to battle every day, which is why uh, I sought elected office and people are always surprised uh, the first time I open my mouth because I don't behave in the model minority model Asian woman um, stereotype. All right, Carmelo. 
Vaya. I think he answered the question. Oh, he answered first. first. Okay, thank you. I yeah, was yeah, I was, I was first. I mean, I'm going to go All on. Right. <laughs> All right. No, no, he's wondering, well, where was I going there again? All right. All right. Is the vote a right or a privilege? And we did an essay on our campus and we asked, is the vote a right or a responsibility? The Constitution says we have a right. That's our sacred right, and that's to vote. And yet we find that instead of making it easy for our citizens to vote, it is often very difficult. Just this week, it was reported that some of our citizens, and they are voting in droves, by the way, at this time, waited eight, nine, 10, and even 12 hours in order to vote. My question to you will be why, and would you say this is voter suppression? And I'll start with you, Carmelo. Definitely. I mean, we're just having the conversation in Puerto Rico that you guys have been having for the last month. Just for the first time in history, we're voting by mail. Uh, here in Puerto Rico, we have an 80% turnout. So when you talk about voting, it, it's, it's kind of a personal kind of thing. It's about you going to the polls. It's about staying in line, talking to people you know. And it's about casting your vote. Then again, uh, when I look what is happening in the States and what is happening in Puerto Rico, and when I'm because I have learned from many of your experiences about how you get your districts, how you get your representation, how, uh, for example, in Florida, until recent time, we did not have in the Puerto Rican community a member of Congress who was or something that looked like us. We had Alan Grayson, uh, a Jew, great guy, by the way, uh, but he wasn't a, a representative of my community, but the way it was structured, we were suppressed. Now, that has improved a little. Not a lot. Now we're talking to the next step, which is voter suppression. How you can profile that in communities that you know that people will vote one way or the other, you can put obstacles so those people cannot vote. And that's something that worries me. So when you ask the question, is something that is voting a right or a privilege? Depends who you ask. Uh, because if you ask a politician, it's a privilege that people will vote for you. If you as a human being that wants to be part of it, it is a right. Now, that right should be accessible to everyone? Yes. Uh, should it be count one man, one vote? Yes. So how come it's not that way? Well, there are many issues around the way uh, or around the corner, but I think what is happening in the States, I'm, I'm looking from outside the box about border suppression, profiling, and about this thing about postal office, it's something that I never thought I will see in my real time or in my time. I think it will go away, uh, but it's something that we need to take a look at it because I don't see the same lines in every community. Uh, or the, and, I, and I've been watching. I've been watching. It's something that really worries me. So at the end of the day, yes, there's border suppression. Yes, it's because of color or whatever color it is. And sometimes scientifics are wrong because they are predicting is a Democrat or Republican. You don't know. Uh, millennials are changing, and they're going independent sometimes. Hmm. Okay. Gene. Boy, um, I don't know if it's technology. Is it uh, the, the pandemic, COVID? Uh, yeah, hopefully these are things that are being worked on and, and fixed. We uh, think we all agree that it is a right and responsibility. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, every American goes and votes, you know, having early voting and, and I believe most every state helps take away that long wait on election day. That, that's a help. Hopefully, you know, it's being done fairly everywhere. I, uh, hope that also that having you know the structure of government we do where we have state and local government that's involved in 
the election process bipartisan where you have poll watchers equally that things are being done right that they're not uh, they should be you know that should be a top issue to get corrected that's you know I, I guess I'm not seeing that here in Kansas but maybe it's different in you know, in neighborhoods where you know there's more people and, and more population but hopefully that's being addressed and not just ignored. I, I would, would hope that that's the country we live in, that that's a, that's a top priority to fix these problems if they exist. All right, no, it or hasn't been reported. Thank you, it hasn't been reported in Kansas. You know, a lot of this has been yeah, in and, uh, other country, I mean, in other states uh, and even this week. You know, but it hasn't been in Kansas. Well, hope, hopefully that that gets, hopefully that gets corrected. You know, now's because we're what fifteen days. Yes. So you know, now's the time to get that fixed. If it's going wherever it's going on, it needs right. to be fixed. Okay. All right, Christina. I believe voting is a right, and I look at this question reflecting on myself where I grew up thinking my voice didn't matter. I didn't grow up in a political circle. I'm very, fairly new to politics and this isn't unique in the indigenous community. You know, our, vo our voice and our vote feeling like we don't matter, I feel like is the successful work of voter suppression that is putting us this, in this mindset. And when I look at our indigenous history of voting, you know, we were just citizens less than 100 years ago. And we can look at different states in the Southwest who had voter discrimination less than 100 years ago, less than 60 years ago. Um, these are all still type of, still fresh. And we see in other races in other states how, you know, in Montana or in Alaska got, that got Senator Mikowski in, into her seat, that was Alaskan Native votes. And in Montana, we have reservation Native American votes that can, you know, flip, flip a seat. It's really inspiring to see my indigenous communities across the United States. You know, if we get invested in and we get educated, I feel like the bare minimum of education on how to vote is a very complicated process. And even for us here in the state of Kansas, it's like, do you need an ID? What if it's expired? Um, there's all these, a lot of exceptions where it should just be plain, simple, and easy. You know, looking at situations too and solutions on same day voter registration or making it a holiday. You know, these are really great ideas and I really would love to see the state of Kansas move forward into making things just plain and simple. The average person doesn't have time to go Google and find all these little exceptions. Um, but I believe that voting is right. And I, you know, I kind of get a little upset because people will sometimes tell me that are kind of in a place of privilege saying, why don't people go out and vote? They don't understand the history of us people of color that we went through, through the discrimination and through, you know, the history and the laws that have been put in place that it's taking a little bit of time. And it's taking, you know, us for me to be in this uh, candidacy and for Congresswoman Therese Davis, Congresswoman Deb Holland, Representative Punkwe Victors, for us to see us in these positions and say, okay, we can do it. We can participate in this system that was built to suppress us, that tried to get rid of us. Okay, I guess it's okay to participate in the system now. All right, all right, Sharon. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm just reflecting on how, uh, uh, what a blessing it is uh, to be following uh, uh, representative elect uh, Has, Haswood uh, because your enthusiasm is very uh, inspiring. Um, you know, I, I too come from a perspective and you know, I'm, I think I fall on the older side of the spectrum um, where um, both from um, the lessons of my um, my people, my community, uh, as well as uh, from my upbringing in a certain sort of generational era, um, I do see it both as a right and as a responsibility. And um, you had also asked Barbara if we thought of it as a privilege and it does fall into that as well. And so 
the way I kind of uh, take a look at it is this way. Um, many of you may be familiar with uh, the fact that during uh, World War II, um, uh, Japanese Americans, uh, for no reason other than their uh, ethnicity and um, the way they looked, were incarcerated. And this was, you know, a common practice. It's not just Japanese Americans. It's happened to uh, natives. It's happened to Latinos. It certainly happened to African Americans. Um, but for my story and for my purposes, uh, my mother, who was nine years old at the time, uh, who had not committed any uh, crime against the United States, was incarcerated. Uh, even though she was born in the United States and her mother was born in the United States. Um, so we're talking about two citizens with birthrights to the ability to vote. Um, my grandfather, however, was not because he was an immigrant. And so when you talk about, is it a privilege? Yes, it is a privilege. It's not necessarily always a right. Um, uh, but once you have either earned it or by the fact that you are born with the right, that's the case that you have a right, um, then um, I think it does become our responsibility to exercise it. And that becomes that sort of sacred trust. But I say this in part because there was a time in history uh, when you might all recall, and we've been talking about voter suppression, but uh, our laws have been long used as part of voter suppression. And there was a time once, uh, not that long ago, uh, where you had to be white and you had to be a, a male property owner in order to exercise the right to vote. Um, I raise that because there's a very um, uh, little known case uh, in California uh, that determined, at, on the one hand, uh, that Asians were white. Now, we couldn't own land, so that there you go. Uh, we couldn't vote. But we were white until there was another competing lawsuit that determined, no, we were not white. So, um, I th and that kind of reflects back on your first question, Barbara, about, you know, why is it difficult to talk about race? Well, for Asians, it's difficult, too, because... Uh, we've been tossed all over the place by the courts. The last thing I think I'd like to just share uh, for um, just the sake of uh, thinking about how laws are being used for voter suppression. Now, I happen to come from a state that has had uh, mail-in voting for quite some time. And during the time of mail-in voting, uh, I, I, will, I have to say um, our uh, numbers in terms of members of color we have a members of color caucus. We have a black members caucus. Uh, we now have 24 members out of 147 members in the legislature who are people of color representing 16% of all the voting members in the House and the Senate. And yet we do still experience voter suppression because uh, as you know, um, very relevant to today's conversations, um, people of color are disproportionately incarcerated which means that they disproportionately lose their voting rights unless the state uh, enacts laws that restores uh, the right of former felons to vote again. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, as a leader, what role do you think leaders can play in improving race relations and improving the climate uh, for less conflict and animosity among races. Do I need to repeat it again or you're okay? Okay, who goes first? Well, since you asked, you may. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so for me, uh, it, it's probably different from what you guys experienced in the States. We have two local parties, uh, pro statehood. Uh, actually, we have three pro-independence, and, uh, and we have also uh, Commonwealth, uh, which is kind of a status quo. And then I fly over two hours to Florida and I encounter myself being either a Democrat or a Republican. So it, call that complicated. And then add to the equation that uh, when I go overseas uh, to the mainland uh, as, a, as a Democrat, uh, members of my party are 60 to 50% Republican. So I'm bipartisan at the national level 
and uh, partisan at the local level. You go figure that one out. And uh, so how do you actually deal with that? I think an experiment like the Quad Calculus actually hits a point. It's about breaking the ice and talking to each other across the aisle. It's about uh, learning and, and caring about your community and the community next to you. It's about uh, asking the tough questions. How can it help? Uh, or how can we can complement each other? It's about reaching out and saying like to my very good friend, Benny Shendo, uh, who was my first uh, experience with the Native American community. I mean, I've, I've seen him. I talked to them like, hi, bye. But I never actually took time to say, so why are you called Pueblos in New Mexico? And uh, then I, I then uh, what is it with the food deserts? What is it with health disparities? How come uh, you guys live in areas that are far away from the cities? And those questions that probably were not obvious, but it was something that I ignore because it wasn't part of my conversation every day. Asking those questions got me closer to probably come and talk to Tomiko and ask about the Gang of Four, uh, something that uh, is in the movies. And I see the movie, but I was okay, so that's it, it's in the movies. But I never heard the story and actually reached out and said, okay, so this is how you guys got organized. I think that's a great example how blacks, whites, Minorities all came together and said, well, let's make this happen. Indiana, for example, my first time in Indiana uh, to visit a pharmaceutical, all white. And I said, well, what's going on? I said, well, we live here and they live next door. I said, why? Uh, but things are changing. But we have to actually have the conversation. And uh, the same with the black community, even though I thought I knew a lot about the black community uh, because I went to a historic black college then I realized getting elected is not as easy even within your community. And talking to people like Barb, uh, I call it Barb, but it's Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> talking, to people, uh, talking to people that actually live every day, you say, well, it's complicated. I mean, getting my point across. So, and to sum up, Latinos. I mean, immigration is a big issue, but it wasn't my issue. And then I realized, well, it's my issue as well, because I need to actually reach out and get the conversation going then to talk about equality on my issue because I'm a U.S. citizen that happen to not vote for the president of the United States just because I live in an island. But if I move to Florida or Kansas, then I can vote. What's the deal? So those are conversations that we need to have, and they're complicated, but it needs to be done. Yes. And, and territory is good but limiting in so many ways. Thank you. All right. Uh, Christina. The roles in leadership play in race relations. Um, you know, I agree. We have to have these tough conversations and invite people to these conversations. You know, me being a first time candidate, a lot of my conversations happen through the phone, um, through all ages and all demographics, because an issue impacts people very differently. Politics is very personal. If an issue of, you know, here we need to uh, Medicaid. Um, how does that impact somebody who's elderly in comparison to somebody who might be younger and lower economic status? Um, I really think that, you know, we need to um, educate ourselves too and create a more innovative solutions. Um, I am still learning every day on how we can make voting a lot more easier for, for Kansans, um, for my district as well. One of the examples I remember is we had ballot drop boxes here in the Douglas County area. And we noticed that in my district, I have Lawrence and Baldwin City. Baldwin City didn't have a drop box. So I reached out to our county um, elections guy and asked him, can we get a drop box there? Because you know sometimes the mailing system isn't as perfect and crisp as people can trust it yet. But the drop box is another great solution. Um, making sure that every community has that type of access to dropping off their ballot. Um, and making sure that there is, you know, advanced polling places for these other communities that might be in the rural areas, because from Baldwin City to Lawrence, it's a 20 to 30 minute drive. It's getting cold outside. It was raining today, you know, and the weather is just going to continue to get worse. So I think having these conversations, inviting people um, to the table and figuring out solutions together. Okay. Jean? As leaders, we must set a stellar example. We have an opportunity to do what's right and respect each other. 
and do uh, enact policies, do do the things that that draw people together. You know, it, it's um, on us to do uh, the right thing, not because it's easy, but because you know we we need to be the example for those that, that we serve. And you know, hopefully uh, leaders across the country unite. You know, I, I think of a time like this where it is an election year, so there's a lot of turmoil. But with all that's going on, you know, we should be pulling together. And hopefully after November, things get, however the elections turn out, things get better. Hopefully we roll up our sleeves and, and, and join arms and, and do what's right. But I've always enjoyed, you know, the 28 years that, that Barbara and I served together. I always enjoyed the opportunity to make new friends, take new challenges on. And, you know, this is a challenge that really needs to be taken on head on. Okay. Uh, for those of you who may have questions, this is your opportunity to send these questions to the chat box. Uh, and I will have, we'll hear again the, the last person, and then we'll have one more question, and then we'll go into the chat box. Okay. Uh, Sharon. Well, thank you. Um, uh, just very grateful for all of the responses that I've heard uh, from uh, my longtime friends and my new friends uh, on this uh, uh, panel, because I think there was wisdom that was uh, expressed by each one of them. Um, and one of the things that I will uh, pick up on some of Jean's comments is uh, the responsibility that we have, um, not just as leaders, but as individuals. Uh, and um, uh, there is, uh, we find ourselves in the position of being elected leaders because we have a passion about something. Um, we were pursuing a dream or we were pursuing something uh, that meant a lot to us because there's no way that we're doing all of that elect electoral work on um, those long hours and deprived sleep and not getting um, fed. Uh, without having that passion. And I really want to uh, call forward uh, Christina's passion because uh, what I'm seeing in many of our younger folks is that passion that I think to myself, well, what happened to my passion? I had a passion once, is it still there? And it is, but I think the environment around us has changed a little bit. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Carmelo referenced that uh, I'm very fortunate um, to have been raised in my area, in my district uh, in particular. Uh, he referenced the Gang of Four. Um, and as leaders, one of the things that we ought to be doing is being followers. And that's where I, I think sometimes we forget that piece that as leaders, we have to be followers. And the Gang of Four uh, in the Seattle area is really a, a group I will call them a ragtag group because I was married to one of them, uh, but it, a ragtag group of uh, individuals who represented very specific racial communities. Uh, we had, um, well, my husband, Bob Santos, was uh, uh, really an organizer in the uh, Chinatown International District of Seattle, uh, which is where he was raised. Uh, we had <clears throat> from the African-American community, uh, a young black panther who eventually became uh, the uh, county council member for this area. We had um, a, a young uh, Bernie White Bear who was a leader among the, um, uh, and created the United Indians of All Tribes Foundation for those um, uh, tribal members who were off reservation who were part of the, the unaffiliated uh, city dwellers uh, who needed still space and community. And then of course we had Roberto Maeslas, who was the founder of El Centro de la, de la Raza. These guys were just organizing in their community. They were you know, doing fishing rights, they were doing housing rights, they were doing 
um, the, uh, the rights of uh, people to wear their hair and naturals. Um, and one of the things about Seattle is that um, our communities of color are so small. These young guys, because they were all young at the time, realized that unless they work together, they would not really be able to affect the kind of change that would benefit their respective communities. And so over the course of decades, they created um, a natural friendship. This, it was a natural friendship among the four guys. So we do have to talk about intersectionality about gender, but uh, these four guys uh, at the time built a friendship where if uh, the Indians wanted to take over Fort Lawton or go um, onto the tribes to uh, address their treaty rights, everybody showed up uh, and vice versa. When uh, the um, uh, elders in the Chinatown International District wanted to build a community garden, the Black Panthers showed up. Um, and that's the way we rolled here in Seattle. And it was a wonderful example of how um, to get things done. And as an elected leader, what's important to me is to be able to follow leaders today who exemplify that same spirit. Okay. Well, I hope if you have questions, you are sending them to chat. And I want to ask Carmelo to do something. You know, he was giving us his background of where he went to school and everywhere else. And uh, I think for the Kansas people and the Kansas City, Missouri people, uh, you will be amazed at this little bit of story that he's going to tell you because as Quad Caucus, we were all, oh, wow, we felt privileged to know Carmelo. So would you tell them a story that I'm sure they can appreciate, especially about the Royals? Well, very simple. Uh, I was the first one to actually play baseball. and. Uh, we got this guy from Alabama, because uh, the guy that I'm talking about was adopted in Puerto Rico, but he was the son of a nurse, uh, a white nurse, and a military uh, black person uh, from Mobile, Alabama. At the age uh, of uh, about within five months, my uncle adopted this kid, and uh, me being a, a baseball player for, even today, I'm, I'm still not retired, even though I, I should be. Uh, I'm still playing baseball. We got to raise this kid uh, as our own, and uh, he developed uh, actually a six foot five kind of Puerto Rican. You gonna figure that one out? That's not you don't see every day. Then he was drafted in the first round, first pick with the Toronto Blue Jays, and uh, then he played for the White Sox. And at the end of his career, he played for the Royals. So I got to see him in the last game ever that he played after 11 or 12 seasons in the Major League Baseball. Uh, he made $110 million, and he retired as a royal right fielder, Alexis Rios, my cousin. <laughs> so I got to see him play in the last game in New York where the Kansas City Royals took the World Series. And uh, to me, it was a big deal, but I never figured that Barbara, Tomiko, Luis Reese, and a couple of the guys from Kansas knew about it because I'm not 6'5". I'm 5'11". So... <laughs> Yeah, we got to make a video uh, to legitimize. Uh, so Barbara has a video of Alex Rios, uh, which he was, he was, he's Alexis Rios, but he used to be the name Alex Rios uh, to his career, saying, hi, Barbara, I know you're a fan. Uh, so my name is Alexis Rios. I'm a world champion. Thank you for your support. It looks like Kansas City baseball is a big thing uh, yeah. down there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then he signed a ball. And I made a video for each one of the members. So, Christina, I might get one from you, even though he's retired. <laughs> well, thank, and, well, and Jim, thank you. Say, and, well, uh, you send me the info and I'll do it. Yes, that was really pleased. Uh, and, you know, and we know how thrilled we were in 2015 when the Royals took everything. So I just thought you could appreciate that story. Uh, and this will be a quick lightning rod question. And then... Um, I can see that we, uh, oh, we do have a question, but let's do this lightning rod so we can end uh, with this. And what advice do you have for someone who has limited contact with individuals who are not their race, but who want to become engaged in dialogue during a time when we are still experiencing social distance right now? So what quick advice would you give to that person who wants to become involved? And I'll start with Christina. 
I think social media has been the platform to get educated on. Um, for me, I follow a lot of nonprofits on social media, um, people who organize a lot of our movements on social media. And I am fed with a lot of information and a lot of positions um, that educate me on terms. One of the most recent education um, video I found was on TikTok where it explained exactly the term BIPOC, um, which I'm a part of, um, Black, <laughs> Indigenous, People of Color. And I was trying to figure out why did we go from POC to BIPOC? And it made sense because oftentimes, and we can see this in my community, um, you know, Native Americans and African Americans often are the, the race that has the highest poverty. They're always kind of within each other. And you can see this too, when we try to create change that we support each other too. Um, with our movements and with our movement of change. I think Google too is another uh, term that us in the indigenous communities like to tell people who bombard us with questions. Um, actually in grad school, I applied for a diversity scholarship saying that I was volunteering my time educating um, about indigenous and tribal sovereignty and Indian health services when the teachers couldn't provide that education. And I actually got a diversity scholarship out of it. <laughs> so I think Google is a great, great place. YouTube is great. Um, I also want to uh, end on a topic called blood quantum. Uh, one of my voters and supporters of my community members brought up this topic when I was um, sharing about I would be on today. You know, learning about our history, you know, blood quantum was something that was not implemented by the United States government that was to get rid of us. So learning about our history and how that's still impacting us today, um, indigenous history is still fairly new. Uh, we still have you know, indigenous studies programs and colleges that are still forming and textbooks that are still forming. Um, but most importantly, from our perspective, not from an outsider from a community profiting off of the textbook of our history, but us becoming the academics, us becoming the researchers and indigenizing and telling the history and stories through our own, own mouth and our own lens. Okay, all right, uh, Jean? I would say uh, volunteer, find, uh, you know, our church recently had the Guadalupe, Guadalupe Center come in and uh, visit our church. Maybe it's been a year ago now, but they're always looking for help. Uh, City Union Mission in our area. You know, there's all kinds of opportunities to roll up your sleeves and go help somebody. Okay. All right, and uh, Carmelo? Well, as leaders, uh, we have a tool that many people do not have. And that's, uh, we, are, we are capable of changing lives and impacting our communities. And our communities are diverse. Uh, regardless where you live, you gotta have some diversity. What about reaching out and representing all the people uh, and taking the oath of we the people as all the people? And, uh, and it's, it's something that has worked for me, uh, probably because I have the quad calculus background, something that I did not have before. Uh, but it's not about color, it's about people. I always refer as people. I, I'm in the business of representing people, making sure that I'm an advocate. And in that way, and using the tools that millennials use, I'm not a millennial, uh, Google, Facebook, reaching out. Uh, I gotta tell you, it's, it's, it's been enriching and uh, it's been a new experience. Uh, it's been something that I have learned a lot, and I think it's here to stay. And this is a new way of communicating, believe it or not. So until we can see each other and hug each other and see Barbara, who happens to be a great dancer, uh, taking the steps away, this is the way we actually got to reach out. All right. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Yes, and if anybody's interested, I actually have video evidence of uh, what Carmelo is uh, talking about. But uh, on a serious note, for um, in, in response to your question, um, I will double down on Carmelo's comments. Um, I think you it is important to do a lot of learning, that's true. But there is no substitute for building a relationship. And that is really what came out of the Quad Caucus is um, the relationships uh, that were built. They were built over time to be sure, 
Um, and initially, I think a lot of us were just trying to get to know uh, the other members of our own racial group uh, because we were literally thrown together. Not all of us knew one another. And, um, uh, but I will never forget the, the one meeting that just seemed to be that moment that uh, there was a breakthrough. Um, and I think there was a prompted question and I'm not even quite sure what the prompted question was, but we were put in small rooms uh, with different uh, representatives and we talked about painful history, painful personal history. And there was no way in the world that any a uh, person could have walked out of our small breakout rooms without having been touched um, in, a, in a very real way. Um, and so one is the relationship, two is having the humility to understand, to empathize and to listen uh, to someone else. I think that's what I would say. Oh, wonderful. We'll go into a question and then I will do a close. We have a question. Um, Catherine um, asks, when have you been most proud of younger people or America in general for recognizing and working together on racial issues? Start with you, Sharon. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, and so uh, I, I think, as I think back on it, it's, a, it's an awkward uh, point in time. Um, I was most proud of the United States in the week or two following 9-11. Our country came together in a way that was, um, I think it was in part shock and we were reacting to the fact that there were human beings that were buried under rubble, that um, it didn't matter if you were standing next to somebody who was old or young or black or white or Asian, whether they were wearing a, 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 a hijab or whether, um, you know, uh, they were uh, in a wheelchair. Everybody was looking out for one another. And I'm, I have to say though, even though I was very proud of America in the, the, that first week, maybe two following, I think what happened after that is probably the exact opposite is we saw uh, then a lot of old antipathies and um, uh, stereotypes, uh, again, rise up, uh, wrapped up in fear. But for that just one short period of time, we came together as Americans. Okay. Carmelo? Well, to me, um, when Barack Obama got elected, uh, it was kind of uh, not chugging, but I couldn't believe it was happening. I mean, uh, when I saw the people that were organizing, it were young people. Uh, they went against the establishment. Uh, they organized and they made a cause. I mean, they really uh, stood behind what nobody thought it was could be done. And then we had Barack Obama. Uh, but before that, I got to tell you, it impacted me when Obama got elected president. And I saw it. I was there at that ceremony and said, wow, this is changing for real. But then I looked back on the Bush family and the Republican Party, and uh, how presidential they were, uh, how, how respectful to the position uh, they were, and how they, they landed a mark, even if I'm not from that party, to respect what they stood for, even if I don't uh, stand on many of the issues they stand for. And then uh, to the history, seeing uh, what happened lately uh, with the, uh, uh, the passing of a civil rights uh, advocate, and uh, seeing Republicans and Democrats uh, and young people talking about a time that they weren't even born, about remembering how we came together, seeing the photo of Steny Hoyer, a white man, uh, walking around uh, with Blacks, uh, Latinos, all standing for Selma and uh, for one thing, uh, Bush, uh, 
how 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 we can come together and we really take care of. But then I looked at it and I said, this is not all people. This is all this is young people delivering a message. And uh and, and for me that was kind of a, a mixture of all moments to coming together. Uh but definitely to, to where we are now and what impacted me when they were then, uh I think we have ways to come. All right. Gee. Oh. Well, I, I'd agree with Sharon, 9-11, uh, uh, first few days, it, it seemed like what our country should be. We pulled together, families found a value in being together with their family and, and uh, you know, I wish we reacted like that now, you know, under the crisis where we're finding our country in, uh, but hopefully we will. Yeah, there's uh, Barbara. You know, I'm I'm always an optimist, and yes. hopefully uh, we'll get through this tough time, get past this election, and uh, DC will start working together, and state legislatures are going to have a tough challenge. Our governor, our uh, our state going to find a billion dollars. It's going to be a tough year, but maybe that will pull us together. So maybe I, I'm hoping that our, our best days are maybe around the corner in the future. All right, Christina. There's a lot of moments that I am proud of the younger generation. Um, I'm 26, so I get really impressed. Um, Looking back at high schoolers, back when I was in high school, I was nowhere near politically engaged as the high schoolers here um, in my area. And they have helped me a lot through my own campaign. Um, they were willing to volunteer their time, do phone banking, do the hard work that's necessary for our democracy. And, you know, this past summer with COVID-19, I saw a lot of our young people come together for social justice issues, for keeping our elected leaders accountable, um, going and testifying to our maybe our city commission, um, as well as marching down the streets and peaceful protesting. It was extreme, extremely inspiring to see them have this emotion and to direct it into an act of change. And I am so excited, you know, even on the reservation, on my Navajo reservation with COVID-19, a lot of us young, a lot of the young people there delivered food to the elders who couldn't leave their home are, you know, maybe they're hauling wood now and hauling water because we don't have, a lot of us don't have running water out there. So a lot of young people stepped up during this tough time. They understood the value of, we need to protect our elders and those who are in these more risk populations with COVID-19. Um, and I think another inspiring thing is to see how many young people are running for office here in the state of Kansas too, um, of all parties. And seeing people so, it's so inspiring to see them, you know, not only go from activism, but also wanting to change law and policy and, and bring this excitement and bring in this perspective, um, as well as bringing the younger people involved because not only is the change gonna happen now, but what we make today is gonna happen and impact futures in years for, to, for them to come in. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to close, but you know, I want to say I appreciate each of you agreeing to come and join us for part two of a conversation on race. And it was sort of, it was a reunion with my quad caucus. <laughs> and I thank you so much. In fact, I sent a text to Irene to let us know we were on tonight. And Irene is from NCSL, uh, and she was the leader of our group. So I am just so pleased. And Gene Victory, as I told you, I served with him for years. And I consider him one of my dearest friends that I respect so much. And thank you so much. And Christina, don't know you as well, but I know I'm going to enjoy getting to know you and uh, welcome you to our 
Kansas caucus. So I thank you so much. In the beginning, when I started this, I said that the country is so divided and we're so polarized. And it's almost as if one party hates the other party. And we know from the legislature that's not always true. It just appears that way. But it is polarized. And people are worried. People are scared. And they just don't know what's going to happen. But we have a democracy that's very sacred. And it is all of our jobs to protect this democracy. And we talked about talking about race and how difficult it is. We just need to get to know each other. We need to know about our race. We need to know what we're proud of, what our legacy is. All of that is extremely important. And if people don't know it, they don't get to know who we are and they only see us by color. They don't see us by heart, by who we are, how we care, how we contribute to this country and how much pride we have in our country. So I thank you so much for being with us this evening. And I hope our audience learned more about our races and our contribution. And it made it a very enjoyable evening for me. And I hope it was for you, especially when you're spending your time. So again, I would say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And thank we will you. end. Thank you. And thank you. Then, oh, you're welcome. And we'll have to pause a little bit for the closing. So again, thank you. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this evening. If you are a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Join us on Tuesday next week for a conversation with America's foremost political prognosticator, Charlie Cook, where he will join us for an evening of campaign discussion. You can access this program on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel, just like tonight's program. Refer to doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming events. If you enjoyed tonight's program, consider becoming a friend of the Dole Institute by donating to help programs like this possible. We hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you and good night.